Silverado is one of those movies where the movie received mixed reviews by general audiences, but the music world seemed to love the score. Well, we all know the main theme and those soaring horns, but I promise you there's a lot more to the soundtrack, and I have a theory as to why the music was well received. So let's dive in, and no worries if you aren't versed in music. In this video, everybody rides. Right, Jake? Everybody rides! That's right. Naturally, to understand the Western music genre that Silverado employs, we need to take a quick look at the history of Westerns and film music. Firstly, people like Buffalo Bill and Wyatt Earp, with their American Western frontier shows and stories, found their way to Hollywood and sold their stories for movie ideas. This helped lead to 20% of movies up through the 1950s being a Western. Music of these films was primarily folk tunes with a Mexican or Spanish influence. I couldn't locate any definitive origin, but seemingly in the 1930s, these folk tunes morphed into something bigger, most likely influenced by the orchestration of Aaron Copland in Billy the Kid. <laughs> After this, we get a more grand sounding score to Stagecoach in 1939. Despite not wanting to score it, Copeland agreed to score the Western Ballet Rodeo, which became a staple American Western sound. And yes, it's rodeo, not rodeo, because it's the Americanized Western word. Just like this piece is not American in Paris. Anyway, these two works by Copeland laid the foundation for the American Western sound, even being a bit on the nose reference in 1991's Fifle Goes West, scored by James Horner. Have no fear, Billy the Kid is here. It's too tough, kid. Get out while you still can. If you're biting the dust, I'm going down with you. This leads us into the height of the American Western, starting with 1946 Duel in the Sun, scored by Dmitry Tiomkin. This movie started the iconic Western soundtracks, mostly led by Tiomkin, all the way through the 50s and partly into the 60s. This is the era where we got our main classic Westerns today that are referenced all over the place. Let's take the movie The Negotiator from 1998 for an example, and this scene. Let me show all those old, uh, Westerns. Westerns? I did like Shane, though. I'd have, I'd have picked one where the hero lives at the end, you know, like a Rio Bravo or, or a Red River. Okay, so we have Shane, Rio Bravo, Red River, all Tiumpkin scores from this era. Well, I guess you think that Bush and Sundance live too, even though you never see them dead, they're entirely surrounded. All right, so they do reference Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, but that's from later on with a score by Bacharach, but I think three out of four prove my point. So far, I've called them American Westerns, and that's because there are Italian Westerns as well. While there are a handful of films prior, it was a fistful of dollars that made the subgenre go global. So now we have Ennio Morricone entering the compositional mix. His scores were certainly influenced by Tiumkin, but these films had themes that were more minimal in instrumentation. With the rise of these, the American Western was already on the decline in popularity. The final big, iconic American Western was probably How the West Was Won in 1962, scored by Alfred Newman, who took what Tiomkin and Copeland had set up before and gave us one of the most iconic Western scores. <laughs> Thank you. 
but really nothing after this would hit as hard, thus the decline of the Western movie. Now, there were Westerns in the 70s and early 80s, and even some with iconic scores like John Williams' score to the Cowboys in 1972. But we didn't get any film with the same impact that we had in decades prior, and certainly none that lasted till today. Before moving on, other notable Western soundtracks and composers I haven't mentioned yet would be Elmer Bernstein's score to The Magnificent Seven in 1960, Max Steiner's score to The Searchers in 1956, and Jerome Morosa's score to The Big Country in 1958. all using their own variation on the genre set up by Copeland and Tiomkin. Now, we need to look at the history of film music for a second, and I promise this applies. The golden age of Hollywood soundtracks was in the 30s to the 50s, primarily because of the use of big orchestras, but composers started using different genres of music in their scores, from jazz to other pop music at the time. The late 60s and into the 70s saw composers start using different compositional techniques that audiences just weren't used to. They're still impactful in their own way, but in a different class altogether. Take the 1969 Planet of the Apes, score by Jerry Goldsmith. This is an example of 20th century compositional techniques like the 12-tone matrix. This is most likely one of the main reasons Star Wars became so popular, just because it used a classical score rather than something more modern. Moving into the 80s, we now are getting electronic scores, like the mechanical sounds to the Terminator. Or the Moog synthesizer heavy score to Tron. Film scores were really taking a new direction. Yes, there are iconic scores in this era that don't fall into this category, but that's partially why they are remembered more. This now finally leads us back to 1985, over 10 years since our last big western hit and soundtrack world that's going in electronics direction, we get Silverado. Going back to the roots of Copeland Tiumkin inspirations, AJ, let's go. Of course there's more. Bruce Broughton was no random composer hire, and a left off part of the Western's history as well. The 60s saw a major rise in television, and the Westerns jumped from film to TV, giving us classic Western shows like Gunsmoke, Dallas, and the TV series How the West Was Won. You know what all three of those shows have in common? Bruce Broughton scored episodes of each. Of course, with the popularity of these shows, Bruce takes inspiration from How the West Was One TV show for his theme in Silverado.
So the main theme we have is basically a textbook combination of everything that has come before and takes us back to the orchestral roots that many film scores were changing from. That change is happening today as well with the rise of strange instruments and minimalist textures of Hans Zimmer and others. With the exception of a few movies like Inception, Interstellar, and Dune, the bigger and more loved soundtracks over the last decade were things like How to Train Your Dragon and The Incredibles. And look at all the recognition Bear McCreary got for his recent works like God of War Ragnarok and The Rings of Power. This means the world to me. Thank you so much. So now that we have the background we need, let's take a look at a few key elements of Silverado's score with a few that differ from the main theme. Starting with the primary themes the film uses, we have our main title, a big orchestral sounding piece with fanfaring horns for four bars serving as an intro into the trumpet's theme. <laughs> This theme on the trumpet is our main theme for the film. And is heard prior to us hearing that horn fanfare. It's right in the opening cue, only a few bars in. We actually don't get that iconic horn line until 36 minutes into the movie when our four main protagonists are together for the first time. That horn line actually hits a lot harder when watching the film after being aware of the theme too. It's that, when's it going to hit, kind of a feeling. The B section of the theme is a bit lighter, relating to classic western soaring string lines, but also helps bridge the gap to the other main theme of the movie used for the settlers, which I'll talk about more in a minute. The C section of the theme is another bridging material, but instead of lighter, it's heavier, giving us a stronger heroic pounding rhythm. As I explained earlier, the early Western movies were based on folk songs, and that's where the second main theme comes into play. The Settlers theme, or what Broughton calls the family theme, is very much in the same folk style with a simple harmonic progression in an ABA setting. The A section is basically a one and a four chord with a five chord or half cadence at the end of the first phrase. See you again, man. I think I'll ride along Let's take a look at this. Farmland. The B section is actually a little bit more complicated with a change of key to the relative minor, but it does bridge back to our original key going back to the A section. Tyree serves as our main known villain, as Slick and Cobb are revealed later after their introductions. So Tyree gets a villainous theme, or rather a figure. Hey, look who's here, Tyree. Now, this is what's stated in the score that you could buy from Omni Music, and while these analyses are generally very well done, I disagree with this one because the motivic line that is presented here for Tyree, while correct, can actually be found throughout the score for other events, like when the McKendricks attack in the cube Party Crashers. And while I know Tyree is in the scene, this spot here seems more applicable to Cobb since it's right when he says, Don't shoot the sheriff. That's against the law. So maybe a villain theme? Well, it also appears when Emmett talks about breaking his brother out of jail. Oh, I gotta bust him out of there. So I theorize it was more of a breaking the law motif, perhaps? The final motivic line to look at is Mal's theme. At first, I didn't think it was truly a theme for him, but we got an outline of that theme when we first meet him. That ain't right. I decide what's right in this jurisdiction now. Move. 
And of course, it's the foundation for when his father dies. This theme had so much potential too, and would have been great if it was weaved into more scenes, like when Mal saves the trio as they got run out of town, for instance. Is that them shooting? No, it's Overall, Silverado is a solid score that uses two primary themes to unify the movie together with a few other ideas thrown in for variety. The story of the movie and the style of the score is honestly nothing new, but with a huge gap between traditional Western movies and the film scores venturing into more of the electronics, the music for Silverado brought us back to the classics with what we have come to expect. A fanfaring theme in the horns and trumpets and a folk song for the townsfolk. Now, if you'll excuse me, I need to meet a composer in Washington before heading to California to analyze another film score. We'll be back. We'll be back! <laughs>